What we're going to talk about is the keys to leadership. It's a series I've called Arise, the call to leadership. So again, the series is going to be called Arise. Simple as that, Arise, but the call for leadership. And the goal is very simple. I want to equip each of you with understandings that will allow you to become a leader, not just for God in church, but a leader in your marketplace, a leader among social circles, a leader anywhere you go, because I believe that God was not constrained to four walls, which is why you don't really see him building a church, per se, physically. He was building the church everywhere he went, amongst publicans, tax collectors, sinners, the social outcast. He was just building a church everywhere he went, and that's what allowed him to become a leader in many ways, but he was investing that into his children, spiritual children's disciples, if you will, and I want to do the same thing. And I want to start with the verse. It's a little bit eclectic, but I want you to see it. Romans 6, 5. I want you to see there's a promotion here. Romans 6, 5. If we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That is a very open-ended verse. What happens when Jesus ascended? Where did he go? Right hand of the Father. What was he called? At this day, all knees shall bow, every tongue shall confess, Philippians 2. At the same time, it also said he's become king of kings, lord of lords. So when Jesus died, the ascension had an essence of a promotion behind it. And it says when we, we come to his likeness of death for baptism, we should also come to the likeness of his resurrection. So what does that mean? We should be promoted. What did Peter really take his chief apostleship after Jesus rose her again? So that's the idea. So for each of us, we carry a greater power in the likeness of his resurrection. I'm going to go way more detail than that. That's going to be kind of an overarching verse that kind of gets this conversation started. But here's what I want to do. I want to read a verse that I want to ask you an open-ended question about leadership. Let's look at it together. It's going to be Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9 through 15. It's a little bit longer passage, so let's do it together. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9 through 15. We're talking about how each of you are going to become leaders. Actually, you already are, but the mantle will come alive. All right, let's do this. Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 11. And that was 9 through 12. But it says, I spoke to you at that time saying, I am alone not able to bear you. This is Moses recapping his story. The Lord your God has multiplied you. And here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. So there's been an expansion, a multiplication of the ministry of God. God's people are growing. And he says, I'm not able to bear you alone. Verse 11, may the Lord your God, your fathers, make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he promised you. Meaning, the leadership is not the limiting factor. Everybody see that so far? We're going to talk more detail. I'm just kind of getting warmed up here. Moses said, the people of God are great. And I can't bear it by myself. But let that not be a limiting factor in the growth of God's people. May God bless you and increase. Verse 12, how can I alone... Bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints. Keyword complaints. Just kidding. 13. Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you've told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, hundreds, Fifties, tens, and officers for your tribes. Three questions to get us started. Three questions. First of all, does God operate through leadership? Just rhetorical here. Does God operate through leadership? Are there levels of leadership? Last question. Are there qualifications for leadership? One more time. Does God operate through leadership? Are there levels of leadership? Does God, uh, uh, does God have qualifications for leadership? You can imagine my answer is yes. Yes, 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 and yes, and yes. And I hope you saw that. First of all, where did I say that God uses it? In essence, Jesus, I'm sorry, Moses is speaking the word of God here. And he's declaring to them that this is what God has commanded him to do. To bring forth men of leadership. But not just any men. And furthermore, there would be levels of leadership in the group because of the size of people. And if you're willing to believe it, that's operating all over churches today. 
And that's fair. I'm, I'm, saying it's a bit, I'm saying that's not negative, that churches have levels of leadership for different kinds of qualifications, for different kinds of groups of people, some big, some small, and all are needed so that God can move through his church. Let me ask you this. On a very light level, at that time, how many tribes were there? Twelve. Twelve. Was there a leader of each tribe? Yes. Yes, each tribe had a leader. Will the tribal leaders have a leader? Yes. Who was their leader? Who's talking? Moses. Moses. And then Joshua. So the leaders, leaders had a leader. Twelve, the lead, tribes had a leader. The tribal leaders of the twelve. The tribal leaders had a leader. Joshua or Moses. Did Moses and Joshua have a leader? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we got it out. All right. Now that we got that out of the way. You would say, Michael, that's kind of Old Testament. Would you mind reading for me Revelation chapter 7? Verse 9 through 11. Revelation 7, verse 9 through 11. Let's just see if that matters today. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one can number. Revelation 7, 9. A great multitude all of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands. Just leave it there for a minute. The nation, no, heaven nation, right, when we all go upstairs, there are tribes and nations and tongues of all kinds of peoples. And I'm willing to bet, because I've seen this with my own eyes, that there are people who led those tribes in heaven. They show who led those tribes. My prayer is that y'all would be those people too. You catch that? My, my prayer is that you would rise up to be leaders of your tribe, your people, your nations, your languages. Just trust me, I've been there. So my hope is that as we do this together, you will not only arise as a leader, but you will be used mightily, not just for the sake of calling yourself a leader, but that you would be used for this. So let's get this started. Deuteronomy 1.13, going back to a verse. Let's talk about today's conversation. It's going to be a multi-sermon discussion. Let's just look at today's focus. Verse 13 from that same chapter. Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I, and I will make them heads over you. So there are people who are qualified for the job, and then God begins to work in them. Who heard that? There are people who are qualified for leadership, and then God begins to work on them and make them. That sounds familiar to Luke 5. Anybody remember about Peter, who did not qualify himself for God, and fell at his feet and said what? Chuck the D. Depart from me. And God said no. Jesus says specifically, I will make you a fisher of men. Nevertheless, he was made into a great leader. So the framework I've given you is primarily Old Testament. But how many of you guys have ever heard of the term the pastoral epistles? Yes. yes. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. Mm -hmm. Those chapters tell you what a deacon must be, an overseer, a bishop, behaviors of church, behaviors of elders and young people, behaviors of how you conduct yourself through different ministries. All behavior. Are you all following with that? Not how many times you read the Bible. Are you listening? Not about what you think you know about God. Purely behavior. Would you mind just reading 1 Timothy 3, verse 2 and 3? Just to give you a throw down. This is the whole books. Timothy, Titus, Titus are all behaviors. A bishop must then be blameless. That's a behavior. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good, oh, wow, good behavior, that's easy. Hospitable, able to teach. Keep going. Not giving a wine, I believe. Keep going, verse 3. I'm sorry. I mean, I didn't give it to you. Then I'll read it. Not giving a wine. That's verse 3. Not violent. Not greedy for money. But gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not covetousness. Thank you, sir. You can put both up there. That was one of them. If you look at these chapters, it even speaks about Timothy and his behavior, how we should conduct a ministry when Paul sends it. Those pastoral epistles are primarily behavioral. But what was the result of your behavior? What have I been saying all day? Call to your leadership position. Come on, guys. Today's focus is behavioral. Because God is not looking to see what spiritual throwdown you've got. He's looking at your behavior. The series is called Arise, the call for leadership. See, my friends, you can be like Superman of the Word of God, but if you're more of a bazooka than Bible with your emotions, 
I don't know how far you're going to get. And that's why some of us may just still be sitting on a couch. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm trying to help you. Okay? I just, let's get that out there. So again, today's focus is going to be your emotions. Does the Bible talk about emotions? A lot, right? You want to throw down a few? Anger, rage, jealousy, even perhaps lust and the good behaviors, kindness and mercy and forgiveness, love and charity, all these things. So it covers a whole gamut. It's not like this little, little door hole, you know, kind of keyholes, you only just see a little. It's so open about emotion. The Bible is completely open about emotion, and I'm going to show you how the Bible addresses emotion and show you when emotions don't go well and do go well. And I'm going to summarize that with the word soul. Each of you have a body. I can see you clear as day. Each of you have a spirit. That's why you love God, believe it or not. But then you also have a soul. And what I'm going to prove to you is that your development of your soul is your biggest, at least it's today's discussion, your biggest key to victory as a leader. Your soul. And what happens is, see, for years this church has been so hard on spirit and understanding and wisdom and truth. And I ask God, hey, what can we do together? What shall I say to them? And this area was made clear to me. I thought, you know what, that makes perfect sense. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. That's why I get so excited when I'm praying in the car, because I'm like, this is what I need to understand to teach people to rise up leaders. So first thing, we're talking emotions today, we have a lot to talk about. The first thing is, the first step to become a leader. There's two groups of people. Every one of you are going to fit in this group. And sometimes you're in one group and sometimes you're in the other group. Listen. You can either control your emotions as a man with soul, or you can be controlled by your emotions. Is that not true? Don't think anybody's exempt. You can either control your emotions, because all of us have emotions, or you can be controlled by your emotions. Now here's the thing. As a leader, that is the most paramount characteristic you will carry for the rest of your life. That is the most important understanding you will have for the rest of your life as a leader. You know as well as I do, that emotions make you say things or keep you from saying something. You know emotions will make you buy something that maybe you didn't want. Emotions will make you do things that you say, why did I do that? Emotions can also keep you from doing things. Emotions can keep you from saying things. Even your, the area nobody wants to go to, your thoughts. Friends, that's not an easy thing to say. But when you're in leadership, you will be challenged primarily here before your hands do anything. Is that fair? As a leader, your mind, your soul is challenged by circumstances. And not only that, a greater influence of circumstances because you're saying, I'm a leader. Those circumstances point to you, whether or not it has anything to do with you or not. It's pointing at you. Is looking at you. It's wanting you to do something about it. But if you are controlled by your emotions, it can go horribly south. And you won't be much of a leader. Or if you're able to control your emotions and handle yourself, you can make decisions that can turn a situation back around. It's making sense? I know the prophetic study was quite compli complicated, so I asked God, let's do something more ground, but just as impactful. I believe that God's doing that today. Let's talk about this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24, gives us a list of things that we can talk about as soul aspects. I know it says fruit of the Spirit, but just listen. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now look at verse 24 carefully. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Look at the second one. Gentleness. What is that word? Self-control. You know, the Greek word is basically self-dominion. Remember dominion? The four powers? The powers of the Holy Ghost. One's called dominion. Self-control is self-dominion. You have a dominion over your own behavior. That's self-control. And how do you get there? When you crucify your flesh, your weakness, with its passions and desires. Is that small and small? Can you imagine crushing your desire? 
It's not easy, right? Can you imagine throwing away your passions? Is this easy? No. That's why there's not that many true biblical leaders. Because the framework is you are able to crucify it. Not even just stop. Eh, I've got good control. Once in a while it kind of flares up. It is dead. Crucifixion means completely dead. No resurrection here. The flesh with his passions desires are dead. That is self-control. Now let me show you an application. The danger of what happens when self-control doesn't work the way it should. Y'all doing okay? We're going to be a little late today. I hope you can do it. And just write down 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13 is a story that for me is a tragedy. Do you remember the first king of Israel? What's his name? Saul. Saul. And Samuel was a prophet who carried the mantle that rose Saul up. So it was like a, a father-son relationship. But ch chapter 13 in 1 Samuel is his tragic end. Not his death. His tragic end. Because he begins to feel the pressure of a leader. He's like a young leader. He's a king. He's the first king. There's no pattern. There's no reference. He happens to have the first Abraham Lincoln hat on. It's no small thing. And he makes a mistake. Look carefully. So Samuel shows up, verse 11 through 12. I'm just taking a section. I want you to read chapter 13 on your own. So Samuel shows up and says, what did you do? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered for me, because the Philistines were coming, and that you did not come within days appointed, and the Philistines gathered a big mass, verse 12. He continues, says, Then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Notice the key word, I felt compelled. A lot of people talk about their feelings when it comes to God. He had feelings too. How did it turn out? Matter of fact, if you read the chapter very carefully, that's why I'm asking you to read it. Saul says, or Samuel says, what have you done? For God has now what? Rejected you as commander of God's people. And he's found another man who was after his own heart. So what is going on? Was Saul a warrior? Yes. Was he a mighty man of valor? Yes. Was he a leader at that time? Yes. But when his emotions grew weak, and he saw people bailing out. And the Philistines are coming. He said, oh God, you're not here. I'm going to drag you out of your hole. Samuel said, you're not a leader. It had nothing to do about him being weak or sick or any kind of physical weakness. It doesn't matter if he read the Bible more times than you. It didn't matter. What happened was his soul, his emotions took over that circumstantial evidence as leader. All pointed back to him. And he's looking around and says, what do I do? And he says, I can't handle this. God, where are you? And God says, you're not the leader. You're not the leader. If you talk like that, you can't raise my people up. You're not cut out for this, and you're not going to do it. You're out. Now, am I trying to be that hard? I'm just teaching you 1 Samuel 13. <coughs> do you see how a small framework of what seems like, oh, the word soul. Oh, we have a soul. Oh, there's emotions. Oh, there's emotions in the Bible. But it seemed to me that at the level of Saul's leadership, soul is now a huge problem. Are y'all following that? It's a huge problem. Now, does God want that? Of course. I'm not trying to threaten you away. Like, oh, I'll never go lead at this rate. No, no, no. I'm just telling you the Bible gives us these old covenant frameworks so that we can learn from. What it is is it shows you the impact of what soul does. Good? Good. I have plenty more of those stories. If you recognize that wasn't a one-off mistake, it wasn't God being mean. Later on, Saul... He isn't very good about his emotions. There's a time where he's upset with the Philistines, and he says, no one's allowed to eat until we win. And the people are starving. Jonathan takes his armor bearer, crosses a hill, has a complete victory with two people versus, like, uh, how many ever thousands? Wins the whole war, okay? Comes back, had not what? Had not even heard about this, takes a staff and eats some honey. He gets all happy, right? Honey makes people happy, I guess. <laughs> so he eats the honey, and then Saul says what? Oh, you're going to die. And everyone's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? He just won. You, he just saved us. Oh, well, he broke the oath. You, you get that? Does that sound like emotional leadership to you? Right? Just brash, arrogance, prideful, short-sighted thinking. And God said, well, that's not even that. Later on, Paul, Saul again is losing. Where does he go? The witch of Endor. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So when God said you're not fit, it wasn't just like, he's like, hey, you're dumb. He said, you are showing evidence 
of a pattern of decisions that will ultimately cost us the nation. So I'm not kicking you out of being a Jew or God's people. You just can't. You can't sit here. I'm so sorry. You can't sit here anymore. You follow. So that kind of irrational behavior. You can either be a man, woman, that controls your emotions, or you can be controlled by them. And you can be controlled by your emotions too. But I would prefer, says God, that you stay seated. The series is for raising up leaders. But I'll tell you this lovingly. Leadership is not complicated if we can follow the pattern. So that was the first one. Second pattern. If you don't have the first one down, no point in doing the second. Okay? So I'm just saying lovingly that these are just steps to follow, not just a, a, a download of information. So that's the first one is pivotal to the second one. Second one is just as equally important, but it requires the first. It says, as a leader, if you do not understand the soul of your men or those who you lead, you're not very effective either. You follow that? The first one is your emotions control you, or you control your emotions. You're going to disqualify you as a leader. And then to become an effective leader, if you don't understand the souls or the emotions, or the dynamics of the people you lead, then you probably shouldn't lead either. Let me put it this way. If you have the best idea, but you don't know how to get it across, does it really work? No. If you think you want to pray for people, but you're just an angry, unapproachable man, does anybody want to be prayed by you? Probably not. If you have the best sermon in the world, and you have all these influential ideas, but nobody wants to come near you, you're not very effective as a leader either way. I mean, you can just say, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. If your people are afraid of you, or afraid of the circumstances, if you can't encourage and strengthen them, even when the odds are against you, no one cares. I mean, the odds are even better for you, but they don't trust you. They won't fight for you. The odds could be on your side. You could be out of a kingdom man, blah, 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 and then you have all these angels of power, but nobody even believes in you. You know, I don't understand what are you following that? Do you see the, the pivotalness of this? So there's an essence that just because you're this high-flying superstar, if you don't understand your people, you don't really need to be leading. Just go out there and fight. So how do we do this? I want you to go back to the story of Moses. Just real quickly. Exodus chapter 6, 6 or 9. Sarah to the children of Israel, I'm the Lord. And I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So Moses repeating the word of God. I will take you to my people. I will be your God. Then you shall know I am the Lord. And your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. <coughs> it doesn't stop there. Verse 8. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. One more Verse 9, please, just verse 9. So Moses spoke all these amazing promises, all these powers, all this deliverance. What does it say? They did not? Thank you. They did not heed Moses because, frankly, their souls were broken. You can have the rod of God. You can have the superstar mantle straight from Israel. You can have the anointing oil off, you know, Amazon. None of that will work if your people say, whatever, whatever. I saw what Pharaoh just did. See, Moses had already spoken to them, and they were excited. And then Pharaoh said, what? Take away their straw, but give them the same quota. They said, man, you're making it harder on us. Moses had to understand that. So anyways, let's not go down this road too much, he tells. But does it, do you see what I'm saying? Power is in the end all be all. Saying you talk to God is in the end all be all. Being a prophet is in the end all be all as a leader. Is understanding the people you lead. Doing good so far. Do you follow the pivotalness, the, the, the importance of that your people matter as a leader? You have to connect with them. Let me give you one more story. And I'm just giving you chapters. Would you mind just reading down, right now, chapter 2 Samuel 19? So that was Exodus 6. Just write that down. And just write down 2 Samuel 19. And write down verses 5 through 7. 2 Samuel 19, 5 through 7. I'd like to kind of accelerate a little bit. At some point in David's life, his son Absalom begins to rebel and organizes a coup and steals the hearts of God's men. 
Absalom organized a coup by stealing the hearts of God's men. How did he overthrow the kingdom? Was it by warfare? No. Was it by weaponry, soldiers? No. Just so Absalom was a leader. He was David's son. He was a leader. He had that ability. You see how he could use the people's power for wrong? Just by stealing their hearts? He runs off. David is still on the wrong track. Joab and crew go and find Absalom. What happens? They beat them. They kill Absalom. They come back. Do you remember the story? That's what the story picks up, 2 Samuel 19. That's why it's important to read the Bible. We don't have time to reread the story. And Joab confronts him in the scripture. And he sees David weeping. And because the people of God see David weeping, they get ashamed and they walk up like this. And Joab's like, oh no, oh no. They're not going home as losers because you're upset. And Joab confronts David to his face. And look at this. He says in verse 6, he says, For I declare today that you regard neither prince nor servants. 2 Samuel 19, verse 6. For I regard that you don't really care about us. And if Absalom had lived and we died, you'd have been happy. Look at verse 7. Now tell, look at Job's strength. Because Job's a leader. Go arise, get out of your chair, and go speak comfort to them. For I swear by the Lord, if you don't go out, no one's sticking around. It'll be worse than you than it ever was. You say that's a hard hand. That was him being a friend. That was him being a, an advisor, a man of counsel, saying, you are losing your team. You can say you're king, but it ain't going to matter because everybody's going to walk out. You're going to be a king of one person yourself. And your cat. <laughs> the cat's like, oh, I'm going. You go, Where you got your backpack? He's already leaving. All right, that's why I don't have cats. All right, so that's that. You remember a similar man made a similar mistake. Somebody else carried that leadership power David had. It starts with this. Solomon arises, and his friends say, hey, your dad did some hard things to those same people. Lighten up. Yeah, might take your own advice. <laughs> Lighten up. It might, some, watch this. I got a gold chain. It spins. I got so much gold you can't even count. It's like, you're going to serve me. Everybody gets in the leaves. Do you see how, because he didn't understand the soul, his advisor said, they're broken. Just be nice. Just one day. He's like, no. Thanks, Pharaoh. Good job. Just split Israel and Judah. Completely crack the kingdom in half. Does it even restore anytime soon? No. no. Hundreds of years because of mistake. Some of us need to understand. When you say, I want to be a leader. I want to stand up for God. I want to do something great. I want people to hear me speak. I want to speak in front of nations. Maybe you should study this carefully and say, more than just knowing a Bible verse, more than saying I've got chapter 19 under my belt. Your soul matters. Your emotions matter. How you share, how you lead, how you understand the challenges. They say, no, but I really believe that you should do this, God. I really believe that God's hurting me. I really believe that God wanted my mom in that car wreck. And you want to tell them you're dumb, but that doesn't, that's not a leader. You understand their framework. You recognize that this is what is bold in them. You recognize that the events around their life have made them feel this way. And you come down to their level and you speak to them. Good? Good. <clears throat> That's my flag. We're turning laps here. Because we're on the last lap. There's one more thing about the soul. There's lots of things, but one more thing for this morning, if we can handle it. That's just as pivotal. I said the first thing about your soul is you can be controlled by your emotions. Or your soul can control those emotions, yes. The second thing about your soul is it allows you to connect to your people. You know, David wept when Amasa was murdered by Joab. Amasa was the other king, the commander. Does you remember that? So they murdered Abner and murdered Amasa. And David was upset and wept. And said, oh, the hearts of the people love David. See, he's upset about this crime. Follow? That was a true leader. He cared. So when you connect with your people, even when it wasn't your fault, even though it was angry, it wasn't, maybe it was his cousin, it wasn't even his neighbor's cousin's friend. Not but he still was upset. Still mattered. Still mattered. Final thing about our soul. It reflects God's soul. Listen, and I'll show you. The greatest aspect about why a leader must have soul, it is a conduit for God's soul to come to his people. Yes? I hope you believe me. It is the connection. It's the evidence of God's heart and soul for you comes through his own leader. That's why if you're dead in soul, 
you can't really represent God. You might as well be a Terminator robot, right? You might as well be a machine. Hello, this is NCG. Come to church on time. Okay, close the door. I mean, like, that's not... If that's what's just words. I mean, it should be words. But there's something about an important value of what God says. And it should mean something. But the most deepest connection you have is my soul to God. Truthfully, and your soul to God. And your soul. And if that soul doesn't reflect God's heart, you can't have those emotions. It's all fake. You know people that talk fake? Do you know how irritating that is for me? When you're, somebody's trying to talk fake to me, and I'm like, do I look 12 to you? Like, do I not understand? You're just giving me a speech? We know that. I'm not saying it's just all of us. See, when Christianity becomes a bunch of fake catchphrases, no one cares. That's not how God works. You see all these emotions come from God. The greater of those, of course, you will find in 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Just what are the emotions of God? So what are them? What are many? 1 John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us what? Love one another. For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. One more verse. He who does not love, ooh, does not know God. If you can't reflect the character of God in the way you lead, you don't know him. You're just talking about him like you read him on Wikipedia. That's all you're saying. I heard someone's sermon. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to just borrow from someone else's education. You don't know what that... Do you follow what I'm saying? When you borrow someone's information, you don't cite it. What you're saying is, I know that. No, you don't. You heard it. The man that knows God is able to speak of God's character. The woman that understands God's heart is able to share God's heart to people. It's not an information transfer sometimes. It's inside. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 34. Mark chapter 6, verse 34, please. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude. It was moved with what? Compassion. Is that a, a spirit issue or a soul? That's an emotion. When I have compassion on a man or a woman, I'm having a soul transfer to them. And because his soul was transferred to them, he said, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd, so what did he do? You know, Felsa, listen. What does it say? What do you do? He teaches them. He teaches them out of a compassion. Not out of a self agenda. Not out of I want to be the most popular pastor on the planet. I want to have more people I can shake a stick at. That doesn't matter to me. It's the compassion that gives him the heart to teach. You follow me? His lessons were above all of us combined. But it came from a heart that was connected to God. If you don't love men and women, then you don't love the way God loves you. That means you don't know God. But if you do love God and you know your God, you will teach people and you'll care for them just as our Lord gives his example. Do you think when God became man, he became fully man? Yes? He's fully man. So he had a heart and emotions just like us. When Lazarus died, did he get upset? When people spit his face, do you think it hurt? Yeah, he understood, but did he control it? When the Pharisees said, you're a demon, how do you think that felt? Couldn't he just kill them? Oh, so bad. <laughs> Darth Vader. <laughs> That's me on the carpet. That's how it works. Just like Jesus. I'm like, here. I've got power now. So he was able to handle so much, but he exemplified leadership by not allowing just to spew all over you. What about us? You see, my friends, it wasn't just love. He had mercy. He had compassion. He had forgiveness. This gives us Galatians 6, verse 2. Look at it carefully. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill. Who? See, it's not specific. It just says, let your soul carry another man's soul's problems. That makes you more like Jesus. That makes you like Jesus. Anybody remember where we started? Romans 6, 5? Come on, all the ghosts. Who gave, give it to me. If we were crucified in the likeness of his death, we should be rose again, resurrected in the likeness of his resurrection. There. We should be like that. That's the kind of resurrection I'm talking about. We're almost done, friends. So for me... <clears throat> 
There's one final story I want to give you as we go to communion. Just write down John chapter 13, if you don't mind. John chapter 13. Jesus basically swaps clothes and hands himself a towel. He goes and washes people's feet. Do you remember that? And Peter is approached in verse 6 and 7. He says, what are you doing? You can't wash my feet. Jesus says something very particular. Verse 7, do you mind? John 13, verse 7. Jesus said to him something very particular. He said, what I'm doing, you don't understand. What I'm doing, you don't understand. This table speaks of something that Jesus did that people don't understand. But you'll know. What was John 13 really a picture of? God humbling himself, not as a man, keep going lower, as a what? Servant. Servant leadership is God. God is servant leadership. Peter said, what are you doing, man? I, I chase off kids for you. I chase off widows. I chase off broken people, tatted up, smelly people. Home. I don't want anybody here. We should be the holy club. We're the apostles. We got it. We got it. I mean, we're the best. The Justice League is just us. You'll understand. <laughs> and then God says, you don't understand. You don't get it. I pulled you aside to train you as leaders, not to make you arrogant. I pulled this church aside to make you leaders, not to make you arrogant know-it-alls. Now you understand what Jesus said to this church. He says, please be like me. You know what's a really nefarious verse? Same chapter, verse 2. It says specifically... Judas had another heart transfer. It says Satan entered his heart. He said, I'm going to go betray you. Let's stand up and go to prayer.